the button. Last uh, Thursday in my assembly programming class, I got it. I got OBS up and running. Then I forgot to click the record button, so I didn't record the entire lecture. <laughs> but it wasn't too much too bad because I was just you know kind of talking about things that are not directly related to assembly language programming. Until such time, people try to find jobs. They go like, oh, yeah, I remember Tech talking about something about these, whatever. OK. So the first thing I'm going to talk about today is the birthday problem. And specifically, I want to illustrate using a tree representation how that probability is calculated and why we use permutation and not combination. In other words, why is ordering important? Because it doesn't seem like that. So <clears throat> obviously, a fan out of 365 at each level is not very feasible. So I converted the whole problem to the point where it is easily drawable on um, you know, the little tablet thing. So, I'm ima so imagine that you only have three days in a year. Okay, There are only three days in a year, and there are only two people. I want to find the probability that these two, these two people um, do not share the same birthday. Does everybody understand what problem I'm trying to solve? I'm trying to solve the probability of having two people and not, and those two people having unique birth dates within a year, and that one year only has three days instead of 365. Because this way, I can actually show you the entire tree so it's easier for you to kind of visualize and understand why you know, a tree representation is useful in this case. Okay, so we're going to get started here. So the first one, you know, we'll just say person A and person B, okay? There are two people. So this is person A. And person A obviously has three choices as to what birth date your know, person A is going to be born on. So we have three. Is that okay? So that's for person A, birth day one, day two, and day three of that really kind of weird solar system. <clears throat> so either the planet is revolving around the sun really, really fast relative to its own you know, revolution speed, or the other way around, the planet, you know, you know, evolves very slowly, and so, you know, yeah. Anyway, astronomy, I mean, we just, we just had a solar eclipse. That's why astronomy is kind of fresh on my mind. <clears throat> if I didn't pick computer science as my major, I would have picked, I would have chosen astrophysics, which then means, you know, at this point, I will be somewhere, you know, in an observatory, you know, somewhere. That is not true anymore, because you can actually have a, Observatory or astronomers can now do their thing, you know, any place in the world. All right, so this is person B, okay? So even if person A is, is born on the first day of the year, birth, birth, uh, person B can still be born on the first day of the year. So we're considering all the possibility right now, okay? So we are not concerned about the <coughs> probability I'm just looking at all the possible ways for these two people to have to arrange their birth dates. Okay, does that make sense to you? That we end up with nine possible ways for two people, um, you know, to have birth dates when there are only three days in a year. Are we good so far? So now what we do is we look at each leaf and say, okay, this is one one, this is one two, this is one three. Now the question is, why is what are these tuples and not sets? The reason is simple. Whether the first person, whether person A is born on the first day and person B is born on the second day is different from the other way around, where person A is born on the second day and person B is born on the first day. So that's why they, these are tuples, because ordering is important. Can they both be born on the same day? Yes. So you cannot have one one in a set either. Okay, so that's why you know we are using tuples. So this is two one, two, 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 three, and then here's three one, three, two, and then here's three, three. Okay, so we got nine. So now we look at these nine leaves, and then we ask which ones are unique, which you know, with which leaf. 
that A and B are born on different days. Okay, so I'll just put a check mark next to the ones. Okay, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six. There are six of them. So what, what is the probability that two people um, are born on different days, you know, in the year, um, when the year only has three days? Okay, you guys can tell me what the answer is. Six. Now, six is not a probability because you know, a probability should always be between one and zero. So what would be six? Oh, six divided by nine. Six over nine. Yes. So six divided by nine is the probability that if you have two people, there are only three days in the year that they would not have the same. They would have unique birth dates. Is that okay so far? So the reason why we use permutation has to do with not so much, you know, that we are choosing, you know, two out of three or choosing two out of 365 or anything like that. It has to do with what we are dividing it by. In other words, what generates this nine? That nine is basically counting the number of leaf nodes in this case, and the leaf nodes are represented by tuples, which means ordering is important. So when you're looking at a proportion where the denominator is you know, counting <clears throat> things where the ordering is important, then the numerator should always also be pointing things that are order dependent. Does that make sense? So I hope this helps to illustrate you know, when ordering is important and when ordering is not important. Because in this case, you know, ordering is clearly important because the six divide, the six is not a big issue. The, the, the issue is the nine. The nine is counting things where ordering is important. <clears throat> All right. So are we good with this one? I just wanted to share this here because the other day I just thought about the birthday problem. And then I thought about using a graph or using a tree to represent you know, how we do all the counting. So I hope this you know, kind of helps you understand you know, why we choose you know, permutation and why we divide it by nine. All right, very good. Okay, so with that explained, we can move on to the usual stuff that we talk about in this class. <clears throat> oh, press the wrong button, there we go. All right. So we are getting back to the notes here, um, and we are going to get into some of the kind of ugly stuff you know, at this point. So the ugly stuff, okay, we, we have gone through the calculations or the counting already. So with all the ordering, we're done, okay? We know how to compute you know, the, per, the number of permutation. Uh, we, have, we are done with you know, computing the uh, number of combination. So now we are trying to generate an outcome set of experiments without experiment, uh, outcome set of experiments without replacement. And there are two things. One is you know, where ordering is important, and the other one is when ordering is not important. So this one is when ordering is important because it's counting permutations. So counting is different from generating the set of permutations. Counting is easy, okay? All you have to do is to really have a basic understanding of factorial, and you can do all the counting, okay? No big deal. And it's already useful because you can use that to compute the probability of winning, say, the jackpot. Or you can use it to compute the chances of winning the $7 prize that we talked about the other day. You can even use that to kind of have an estimate of how many people bought lotto tickets you know, in a particular week. So we, we got some really useful stuff out of it. But on the other hand, sometimes you want to generate the actual set of possible outcomes because you want to you know, locate, you want to find a specific um, outcome, a specific sequence. Or you want to kind of narrow down you know, and say, okay, these are not possible. You know, what are the remaining ones? These are not possible. What are the remaining ones? Okay. So there are you know, cases where you already know, you know what the structure is you know, when, the, when you look at the pattern that you're looking at, but you want to you know, single out a particular one. There are many cases where this is important. Um, in some cases, it involves uh, cybersecurity. Um, when, okay, you guys are kind of young and you may not know what is WEP. So 
<clears throat> I'm just gonna show you this. You know, WEP is called Wired, is the abbreviation of Wired Equivalent Privacy, which is before the current standard of you know, using uh, Wi-Fi encryption. Um, I cannot remember, what is the name of the current Wi-Fi encryption standard? Hmm? WEPA, very good, okay. WPA, right? So there's two, there's three, there's enterprise versus you know, non-enterprise. But this is the one before. So the question is, how does this have anything to do with what we are talking about? Just a little bit. With this particular one, the key is so short that um, over, you know, it depends on the, the amount of traffic, but people can rule out possible keys to the point where they can locate the actual key by observing traffic. That's all they need to do. So it depends on how much you use your internet. Let's say you have your Wi-Fi router set up to use WEP, which is definitely not a good idea. Might as well just open it. But you know, if you use WEP, someone can sniff your Wi-Fi network and rule out the impossible keys just based on your network traffic. So if you're watching Netflix like a lot, that means a lot of traffic, you know, someone can probably crack your encryption in less than a day. On the other hand, you know, if you only sign in and do something like very rarely, maybe it will take a week. So anyway, uh, we're looking at you know, an example where we're trying to narrow down to a particular thing. So that means you know, it might be helpful to generate all the possible, um, in this case, you know, the bit patterns and be able to rule out the ones that cannot be the actual key until you find the actual key you know, for that encryption. So that's just an example of why sometimes we want to keep track of a set of permutations. So in this case, you know, I'm using um, a recursive definition so that I can generate um, a set of permutations when I am given a certain number, number of items to begin with, and I'm also given a number of uh, trials to perform. So I'll give you an example of what we are trying to do here. <clears throat> I mean, the other, you know, if, when you look at this, this is a good example. This is, you know, having three possible choices and I have two trials. You go like, but wait, Tech, you know, that's supposed to be six and not nine. Well, okay. The nine is because we are considering all the possibilities. So when you look, the six is because of this. The six has to do with for each, if for each way that a, B do not share the same birth date, then A can choose one, two, or three. But once A has chosen one, B can only choose two or three. Once A has chosen two, then B can only choose one or three. Once A has chosen three, B can only choose one or two, okay? So this tree is not representing all the possible ways because the previous tree is without any restriction. It's basically saying, okay, we just get two random people on the street and we're asking how many ways can their birth dates be arranged. That's the previous tree. This one has an extra constraint in it, which is basically saying, okay, A and B cannot share the same birth date. So if A is born on you know, one of these three days, then B, can, B has to be born on a, on a different day compared to A. So this is with the restriction already placed uh, of without replacement. Is that okay? So we are trying to generate you know, these patterns, right? We're trying, we're trying to generate the tuples that we have seen already. But in this case, we are only generating the two tuples that are representing without replacement so that you don't see one, one, two, two, or three, three in it. Is that okay? So we are trying to figure out an algorithm so that we end up with a set of these six outcomes when the initial trial has three possible outcomes, which are one, two, and three, and we have two trials in this case. So are we okay in terms of understanding what algorithm I'm trying to figure out? Okay, all right. So what the way we're gonna do this is to do it the lazy way. I consider a recursive definition the ultimate lazy way of doing things. Because the first thing you think about is, 
when do I have to do absolutely nothing? Okay, so in this case, the, the okay, imagine you have a bag of three marbles, okay? And then you, know, you have a, you're given a tube, so you can, you know, whatever marble you pick out, you can put it into the tube. Are we good so far in that picture? So the question is, okay, um, I give you, here's, here's the little bag of marbles, and here's a little tube for you to hold you know, all the marbles, the, the marbles that you pick out. But the instruction is, do not take any marbles out of the bag. How many outcomes do we have? We have one outcome because the tube is empty. Okay? <clears throat> are we good so far? Okay? That's one outcome when you are told not to take anything out of the bag and put it into the tube because the tube is empty. Okay. So the question is how do we represent that? So in this case, it is represented by this. So before we go any further, it is probably a good idea to talk about the notation. So omega, in this case, is just the name of quote unquote the function. The little subscript after omega is the number of trials. In other words, how many things are we supposed to be removing from the bag? In this case, it's a zero because I told you don't take anything out of the bag. Okay. In parentheses, we have t, and all t is representing is the set of things in the bag, okay? In, in our example, you know, in this example here, the bag has three items, okay? The three days in a year. Are we good so far? All right. So regardless of what T is, T can be gigantic, okay? T can be like 20 billion you know, things. It can be one thing. It doesn't even matter because I told you not to take anything out of the bag. So the only outcome after the whole thing is done, you give it back to me, you give the tube back to me, it's like, okay, this is the outcome of the experiment. Guess what I get? It's an empty tuple. But it is a set of a single empty tuple. The set is the container of all the possible outcomes. The tuple is a particular outcome, in this case, the only outcome of the entire experiment. Is that concept okay or not? Because this is the thing about recursion, is once you understand what we call the base case or the case when you don't have any further recursion, then the recursive step is usually relatively easy to figure out. So are we, are, is everybody okay with this part here? Because if not, then we should probably talk about it a little bit more. This is very conceptual, even though we can look at it from a very mechanical perspective as well, but it's good to understand the meaning behind the mechanical definition. Yep, go ahead. Yep. Correct. Now, since multiverse is a big thing these days, so think about a multiverse situation, okay? So there, there, are there are multiple versions of you in multiple universes, and each one of you is holding a bag and you know, a tube on the other hand. But in every single universe, you're told not to remove anything from the bag and put it into the tube. So the question is, after that is done, okay? After that experiment is done, do you think all versions of you in all the multiverses would end up holding the empty tube? The answer is yes. So that means that is your only possible outcome, is the empty tube. But it is still a outcome, so that's why the set itself is not empty. It contains one single element. That one single element is a tuple, and that is empty. Is that okay? All right, so now let's think about recursion, recursive definition. So the recursive definition is right here. This, is, this one is a little bit specialized here because it handles two, but this is the general um, recursive definition. So let's take a closer look at the recursive definition here. So the recursive definition is saying that, okay, we are interested in permutation outcomes as a set. Okay, so uh, where do, what do we start with? We start with T, which is a set of the initial, um, outcomes for the first trial. So T is representing the outcome for the initial trial, the trial zero, basically. 
and then I is representing how many more, how many trials are we dealing with. So typically, you want I to be less than or equal to the cardinality of T, because you cannot have more trials than there are items you know that you can choose from in the first trial. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So now we look at this and go like, okay, so how do we that fig how do we figure that out? So this notation, forget about this part here, okay, whatever is to the right hand side of the big U, forget that part. Let's take a look at the big U notation. The big U notation means, you know, we are having some kind of generator expression um, and for each element of T, we generate a particular set. So that means, you know, I'm going to have a gigantic union of a bunch of sets generated by this expression. And then what do I do with all of those sets? Union them together. So this is one of the big notations that we have talked about before. It just looks kind of ugly. Is that okay? So what you want to know is, oh, so that, so from what we are looking at here, if I choose element E, then E is going to put into its own set, and then we have a Cartesian product with blah, 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 okay? So don't worry about that blah, blah, blah yet, okay? You focus on what am I doing at this level? I take each element out of T, and I say, what if this is the thing, the marble that I took out of the, the, the bag and put it into the tube, okay? Then what's gonna happen? So now the rest is basically, you know, okay, if you take E out of the bag at this level, then what is left to do is going to have one fewer trials. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand why there's an I minus one here? Because I just took, you know, I just, you know, take care of one trial. So let's, okay, let's use examples. You're told that you have to uh, find all the permutation outcomes of choosing five marbles out, out of the bag and the bag has 20, okay? So your responsibility with this is to say, okay, let me imagine that I'm taking marble zero out of the bag and then marble one out of the bag, marble two out of the bag, out to, out, of, out to marble 19 out of the bag. But for each marble that I take out of the bag, I'm gonna go like, okay, but what about the other four things that I have to put in the tube? And go like, well, I'm gonna give this problem to someone else, you. So I'm giving you this sub problem here. I, I, I just took one marble out of the bag, so, Here's your bag with 19 marbles in it. So go ahead and figure out all the possible ways to pick four marbles out of 19 where ordering is important. And get back to me when you're done. <laughs> so what am I gonna do? I'm just gonna twiddle my thumbs and go like, wait, wait, wait. So when you come back and say, okay, given those 19 marbles in the bag, and my responsibility is to find out, you know, how many ways or you know, the different ways to choose four marbles out of 19 without replacement and ordering is important. This, this is the gigantic set that I get, okay? So you give me a setback. I look at that and go like, cool. I'm just gonna add my marble and do a Cartesian product with everything that you gave me. So that becomes so this becomes uh, a set of five tuples because you gave me back a set of four tuples and I'm just using a, a Cartesian product with a single element that I have chosen, you know, for my part of the experiment. So now this becomes, this entire thing becomes a set of five tuples but that's only one of 20 ways to choose the first marble, right? So I have to reconsider, but what if I choose the other marble, you know, as my first marble, then I give you a different problem. And then you give me a whole set, a whole big set of four tuples and I do the Cartesian product and so on. Does that, is that working or not? Okay. 
So the definition is actually very simple. Okay, you know, in 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 terms of mechanism, it is very simple. So we'll I'll go through the mechanism one more time and see if you guys understand each mechanism itself. It's the combination of the mechanism and how it relates to the concept that we are talking about. That part may take some time to absorb. So first of all, do we know the big U notation? Okay, just consider this your know, parenthesized your know, expression as something that returns a set depending on E. Okay, so is that notation understood? I, I can give you a simplified example just so that you know, people can visualize a little bit more easily. So, um, okay, I have to switch to the super note. There we go. So, I'm going to give you a very, very specific example here. So we'll just say, you know, in this particular set, we have A, B, and C in it, okay? And, you know, um, and this is some kind of function that depends on E, okay? So don't even ask me what F is. All I need to tell you is F returns a set depending on E. That's all I need to tell you. So the big U notation basically ends up with F of A union, F of B union, F of C, that's all it does. Are we doing okay so far with the concept of the big U notation? It is an extension of the sigma notation-ish. Are we good so far? All right. So with that notation explained, okay, so our focus can now be based, you know, just be on the expression that is parenthesized. So as I said a little bit earlier, the parenthesized expression, the first part is what I choose at this level, at this point of the experiment. This is me subcontracting the rest of the experiment to someone else. So that someone else will give me all the possible outcomes, all the permutations. When that person is told to say, okay, here's the bag, but don't include E because E is something that I have chosen, that I have put, that I'm going to put into the test, into the tube. So that's why you know, the set, the next level needs to start with is T minus the set of E. Is that okay? It is also, this is also the reason why the number of trials is decremented by one because I just took care of one trial out of who knows how many trials to begin with. Is that okay? All right. So if I were to tell you to convert this into actual programming code, what do you think? What, what do you need to turn this into actual programming code? So don't think about C++, okay? Just think about a, any programming language. What do you need to get this done? Okay, so we'll we'll start with every single notation, okay, and then we'll see what we what you can do. We'll start with not even the big U, just E in T. In other words, we're iterating every we're iterating through every element in a particular set. Okay, so you need a mechanism for that to happen. <clears throat> I can tell you, C does not have anything like that. Uh, C does have a template class of set that may have an iterator that can go through every element in a set. Okay, so that can be done. Uh, JavaScript has you know, a built-in set in your primitive, so it can certainly go through every single element in a set. So we got that. Okay, so E in T is done. For every E in T, we're done. What about the union operation? So in order to perform the union operation, you'll be given two sets. And the job of the operator is to return another set where it contains all the elements from the two sets that are given to the operator, but no more than that, right? So depending on the programming language, again, uh, that primitive <coughs> may exist already. I think C++, you know, template class may have that already. I'm not sure. Um, JavaScript just added you know, union as a new primitive of their set implementation. Um, in fact, I can show you that because it is useful. 
So uh, if you go to JavaScript or ECMAScript, that's the actual name of the programming language. JavaScript is the name when it is applied to client-side programming. But, you know, I'm nitpicking a little bit here. Uh, so if you just look up this and go to the Mozilla uh, documentation, then you will find all the ways they can do all the operations they can perform. You can see intersection and also union. And these are new. So if I click on it, you can see that these are new. And that's why it is only of limited availability. In other words, not all browsers have supported this particular feature yet. Um, so you can see Chrome has it, Firefox doesn't have it, and Edge does not have it, which is kind of interesting because Edge is actually based on the Chrome engine. Um, this is Safari. Safari has it too. So um, I'm not sure how many, how many of you will be writing scripts on the client side. This is important stuff, okay? Because you have to look at the compatibility with all the browsers and also how long have this feature been supported? So this is kind of cool, um, cool in the, from the perspective that I don't have to implement my own union function anymore, uh, which I have done like for a few years. Is that okay so far? Okay. So the next thing that is important, just looking at this screen, is do you think you know set operations is actually are actually useful in quote unquote normal programming? Because if it's not, why do you think they would waste the time to implement this as part of the prototype of a set in JavaScript or Node in general? Does that make sense to you? Okay, so I'm hoping that this also kind of helps you to understand set operations are actually very useful and important operations. Even though in all your other programming classes, I guess including 430, they seldom or do not ever use your set operations. They use something instead of set operations, sometimes they would use an array or a stack or a queue in place of set operations. But in many situations, you know, the intention was to use a set operation if possible, but then they use you know, something else you know, because your know, set is not primitive. It's not a primitive uh, type to most programming languages. All right, cool. Okay, so let's go back to here. Um, so we took care of the union operation. We took care of iterating every single element out of um, a particular set. So now the next question is the Cartesian product. So given you know, our understanding of the Cartesian product, if there's no such primitive, but I give you union, I give you all the other you know, primitives with your know, sets, do you think you can implement the Cartesian product operator? Yeah. What about tuples? Do you think you know, we can implement tuples? Because if you look up programming language constructs, no programming language actually says, oh, here is tuple, we support your know, tuples. So instead of mentioning tuples, what, the, what kind of keywords or types do you think they mention instead? An array, okay, and in some other languages, an array is also called hmm, a vector, a list, Okay, so all of those things are basically tuples. Tuple is just a fancy word that mathematicians like to use. But you know, if your programming language supports arrays, lists, vectors, and so on, especially the ones that are elastic, that you can take things out and put things in, you know, then you have your full implementation of tuples. So that means this is not terribly difficult to implement. It's just a little difficult to read because of the use of notation. Are we doing okay so far with this? Yes, go ahead. You can display it like a tree, but it gets a little bit, I mean, the tree that I, that I showed you guys earlier is kind of, you know, what it looks like. So this is the first level 
and this is the second level. And we actually have a third level too. So if you look at it as a tree, we each one of these would go one step further, except it returns a set of an empty tuple. And when you have a Cartesian product with an a set that has an empty tuple, then it doesn't do a single thing. The, in other words, a set of an empty tuple is the identity of Cartesian product. Okay, what did I just say? <laughs> I, I do this a lot because I want to see if you guys are actually understanding the concept. Because I can say something in a sentence where you understand every single word, but what does, what does the sentence itself mean? That may or may not be simple. Go ahead. You can, identity applies to operators. So in this case, it applies, it applies to Cartesian product as, a, as an operator. Okay, so okay, so it looks like you know we can use a little bit of explanation. So this one, these concepts are not uh, specific to CISP 440. In fact, I would say this is you know, related to abstract algebra, which is usually considered the. Um, I know it's politically not correct, but I'm going to say anyway. It's it's all it's called it's usually considered the weeder class of math majors. In other words, those people who can pass an A's you know abstract algebra can become math majors. Those who cannot you know typically have to well choose another major, like computer science. <laughs> okay, so this is what I'm trying to say. So A is a set. If you Cartesian product that with a set that has an empty tuple, then you get A back. That makes it the identity of Cartesian product. Does that make sense to you? So how do we perform a Cartesian product? If I give you all the primitives, like, okay, this is how you go through every element in a set. This is how you can make an array. This is how you can add additional stuff to an array and so on. Um, this is how you can do a union or you know, add more things into a set. If I give you all those primitives, do you know how to implement the Cartesian product as code? <clears throat> yes, no, maybe. I hope the answer is yes, no, okay. I can show you the actual JavaScript code to do Cartesian product. Because it, once you get that code and you look at this expression here, you know, of why I think the set of an empty tuple is the identity of Cartesian product, I think it will help you make a better connection. So let me go to a prompt. And I'll just you know, use JavaScript interactively. Okay, there we go. Maybe, maybe not. I'm thinking. Mm, maybe not interactively. Okay. So I'm going to look at cast.js, uh, your typical extension for a JavaScript program. All right. So we'll go ahead and write a function to do a Cartesian product. So function car Cartesian product. Okay. And we have two parameters uh, A is a set, B is also a set. So the question is, how do we come up with the answer? Okay. So typically, you know, what I usually do, you know, these days when I write you know, anything like this, I'll have a variable that is called result, and I immediately just you know, return the result. Simply because you know this will remind me, you know, of okay, so all the things we need to put into the result, we're gonna do it with the quote unquote result variable. So it's just you know, helping myself to kind of make an environment that's easier and systematic to work with. And in this case, well, we already know what the result is. The result has to be a new set, right? So we say you know, this is going to be a new set, which is a built-in type in JavaScript. So what does each element look like 
in result. Result is a set, we know that. But the question is, how do we construct elements of result? Yes, so how do we construct that? Okay. okay, go ahead. No, but result is a set of tuples. But the question is, how do we construct each element of result? So when, when we look at one single element of result, what should it look like? Yes, very good. Okay, so the first part would be an element from A, and then the second part would be an element from B. Very good. So that means I have to have ways to go through every element in A as well as every element in B. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. So JavaScript makes this really easy because I can say A, which is the name of the first set, and say for each. But for each is taking a callback function. Okay, so you know if you does everybody know what is a callback function or anonymous you know, callback function? No. They haven't really talked about this in 400 or 430. Okay, but I'm just gonna write this code anyway. You know, um, so I will name the variables a little bit more. Um, so that it's more self-documenting. So a callback function is a function that can be called from something else. You, you're basically passing a function as a parameter. Is that concept talked about in 400 or 430? Passing a function as a parameter to either a method or another function. Okay, so I see some nod and some, some you know, shaking. So I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe you guys took your 400 or 430 from different people. That's, so I'm writing a function right now. This is really just a shorthand of a function where the parameter is element from A. Okay, that's the name of the parameter. And this is a shorthand to define an anonymous function because it, the, the function is anonymous because I don't need it anywhere else. The only time I need to assign a name to a function is I have to reference it from multiple places. But if the function only goes to one particular place and no one else needs to know it, I don't need a name for that, okay? I can just create a function, use it right away, and never to have to name it you know, for anything, for anyone. Okay, so now I have to, inside this loop here, okay? So for each, you can look at it as a, as a loop, okay? It's, it's just a syntactically weird looking loop in this case. Um, oh, I, I think there's a better way to say this. That it's much more friendly to people who know C and C++. So let's just use a loop here. So we'll say for let element of A. Now I have to remember, is it of or in? Okay, I'm gonna cheat and look up a JavaScript iterates through set. Okay, that's for each, but I need a for loop. Okay, there we go. Stack overflow. Okay, it's, it's for of. Okay, there we go. Okay, so. Okay, is that clear? That this is a loop. Um, the loop, the iterating variable element of A is going to assume a particular element of A for each iteration. Is that okay? All right, okay. And we can actually build this program step by step because I do want to illustrate what this, how this program works. So we'll go ahead and say car and then we'll give it a set, a uh, new set, um, okay. And new set. Okay, so I'm giving it two sets here you know, where you know, the first one is, only the first one is being used right now, and I'll have a console.log uh, element of A. Console.log is kind of like your C out, okay? This is a quick, quick and easy way to print something, okay? 
So this is my current program, and node cast.js. Okay, it just goes through every single element of the first parameter to the Cartesian product field um, program. Okay. All right. So now we get back here. We have just confirmed that you know this will give me um, every element of A for each iteration. So I need a similar mechanism now to say for and then let element of B of B. It's kind of redundant, but you know, it's okay. So now we say um, console console.log. I'm going to use a backtick here, you know, because it's a cheap and easy way to basically format the output. So I can say um, Okay, so it is just going to be a really short message to say, okay, which element is from A and which element is from B, okay? I just want to make sure that I can iterate through all the elements of A, and for each element of A, I'm iterating through all the elements from B. Okay. Is that okay? All right. So run the code. Okay, that's, that's me because, you know, B is lowercase we go. All right, so kind of not exciting, right? <clears throat> and I also suggest people to write programs like this, you know, just kind of get the control structure working first, verify that before you decide what to do, you know, at the deepest level of the iterations, okay? Because, you know, if your iterations are not going through things correctly, don't waste your time, okay? You know, fix the control structure first before you work on you know, the content inside the control structure, if possible. It's not always possible. Okay, so the question now is, huh, what am I gonna do? I think at this point we can create an element, okay? In other words, we're just creating an element where the, it's a tuple. The first item of the tuple is element of A, and then the second item is element of B, okay? We just want to create a tuple and then decide what to do with it later. So I'm going to say let new element B, and this is how we can basically create an array on the fly in JavaScript. It's really kind of cool. Um, so in this case, we just have element of A, comma, element of B, like that, okay? And then we'll console.log that too. So. And there we go, okay. So we'll run the code again, not surprisingly, okay. It just gave us, okay, you know, this is a tuple, you know, one is the first item of the two tuple, A is the second item, and so on. So now we understand that the control structure is working. Each iteration of the nested loop is also generating, you know, the right element as far as we can, we can tell. So then the next question is, then what do we do? Oh, uh, just generating a new element and print it out is not exactly what we want. We want to add that to the set, right? So now we have to say, you know, uh, result dot add, okay? This is why I like, you know, you know, this VI editor, you know, it can auto prompt what we can do with a set. So it understands the result is a set, and it said, well, you can, you can do all of these things, and obviously this does not include union, because union is a new feature, and it has not been incorporated into um, uh, the language server that you know, uh, this particular Vim extension is attached to. That's okay. We're just adding this new element to the set, like so. Um, the problem is we can't see it now, okay? You know, in other words, I can do a console log here, and it's not gonna show us what we wanna see. We'll, we'll see what it actually shows us here. Oh, it actually does work. Okay, very nice. So this, <laughs> this actually shows us that that function returns a set of nine items, and these are the nine individual elements of that set. Are we good so far? So the next question is, so what does this have anything to do with what we just, what we were talking about? So I'm backtracking to the next, back up to the next level or the earlier level. 
of the identity. What was the identity again? Correct. Yep. Very good. Okay. So here go. So the first time is not going to, it does not seem like it's working. I have to make a little bit of an adjustment to make it work. So I'm creating an empty tuple here. Okay. So the second set of the operator is now an empty tuple. So you, you're going to look at this and go like, but tag, that's not what we're looking at. Okay. Well, that's exactly wrong. Because, oh, okay, I know why. Because I need double brackets here. The first bracket, okay, this is now <laughs> the new operator or the constructor is taking an array to say, okay, whatever is in the array should be elements in the set. So when I gave it initially an empty tuple or empty array, then it goes like, oh, you want to create a set that has no elements, the empty set, right? So, nope, that's not what I want. I want the empty tuple to be the only element of the set. So this would be the proper way to do that. Okay, do again. You go like, but tech, this is not the original set. Okay, we end up with, you know, the second item being the empty tuple, the empty tuple, and the empty tuple. So now you know, there are two ways to interpret the Cartesian product. One is it flattens the tuples. In other words, if A contributes a tuple and B contributes a tuple, then we just make a tuple by flattening the two tuples and connecting them together. We do a concatenation. The other way to look at this is exactly what we did here, which means you, know, you can have a two tuple where each item of the two tuple is itself a tuple as well. So we can do the flattening, but the flattening is going to be a little bit longer to explain, so I'm not going to do that. But you can kind of imagine that if we flatten and say, oh, if you flatten an empty tuple, it just becomes nothing, then this becomes just a tuple of one, a tuple of two, and a tuple of three. So that's why it is, um, yeah. Not not nearly as complicated as that. Yep. It's basically just looking at. Um, okay. Let, let me just add the condition here so that this program is complete. <clears throat> it has to do with how we construct the new element. So. Um, So now I can, okay, if you guys really want to see this, you know, I can, I, I'll, I'll put it like this, okay. The first thing we need to know is whether element of A is itself a tuple. Because if itself is a tuple, then we have to do some flattening. Otherwise, we just take, okay, whatever element of A is, we just stash it there, okay? So, hmm. okay, we have to break this up into, a few operations, unfortunately. Okay. So the first thing we need to ask is, is element, element of A an array? And the way to answer that question is array dot is array, whatever you want to find out whether it's an array or not. <laughs> if it is, then we flatten it. So to flatten something, you put dot, 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 and then element of A. Otherwise, we are not flattening, so we just need element of A itself. So this is how we flatten out A as an element. So now we, do, we need to do it to element of B. So element of B is supposed to be um, um, added on top of this. So now we need to use a conditional statement because otherwise, if it's empty, then we are not really adding anything. So now you have to say if array is array element of B, then we do the flattening. And the flattening part is actually a little bit more complicated now because if uh, element of B has no element, then we simply ignore this whole thing. We, we're not attaching anything to the new tuple. So we have to say if element of B length is not zero, is if it's greater than zero, then we push that. So now we, 
Yes. Then mm. new element becomes whatever new element has, and also everything in element of V. <laughs> otherwise, we just push it. So otherwise else, um, new element dot push. Uh, what is it again? Push element of V, because it's not a tuple. So whether each element is a tuple or not, we treat it kind of differently. Because if it's already a tuple, we have to do the flattening. If it's not a tuple, then we just go like, okay, we just stash it here. All right, so I think this should work. Yeah. Uh, oh, so the dot, dot, dot notation cannot be used here. Um, element of A is grayed out to. Mm -hmm. Here. But it's not complaining about that. You know, before the, um, in the array dot is array element of A, there should be a parentheses around, uh, at the end as well. Another you mean here? No, 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 no. At that array is array check. I think it might be um, just trying to find another end parentheses after that. Mm. I think it's a syntax thing. I think you know the dot 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 notation can only appear inside the square bracket for expanding an array. So it cannot be contained you know, and become its own expression. Yeah, okay. So anyway, but that's the general idea. <laughs> Is that okay or not? Because in, in this case, okay, because of the way we chose um, to uh, create, that we chose to do this, so we already know the element of A cannot be an array, so I really technically do not need to take care of this case and just do it like this. Okay, but that's kind of quick and dirty. <laughs> it's not complete. The solution is not universal. Okay, but does that help to illustrate the concept that the set of an empty tuple can be considered as a as the identity of the Cartesian product operator? Okay. All right. Then what about the empty set? We talked about this already when we talked about Cartesian product. So when you make a Cartesian product on either side is an empty set, what do we get? We actually just saw that earlier today too. Hmm? Yep, you just get back an empty set. That's right. So it's kind of like if you look at Cartesian product as multiplication, the empty set is kind of like doing the zero. But the set that contains an empty tuple is doing the one. One is the identity, the other one just annihilates. Yep. All right, so getting back to, so now we have to backtrack like several levels to get back to the module that we were on. I think it's this one here, there we go. So given you know, JavaScript has a lot of set operations and the newer ones even have union, that means you know, eh, this one is not too difficult to translate into code. And I think that's also one thing I want to, you know, this is a point that I really need to make for this class, is I'm not teaching you guys just math that you will never ever use again, which you have to take you know, to get your degree. <laughs> there are many math classes that many of you probably will not use ever again after you pass that class. I can say that with confidence because just like you, I was a computer science major and there are quite a few math classes where you know, the stuff that I learned from those math classes, I never had to use them ever again, other than just passing that class. But this is different, okay? When do you see, when do you think you can see, you would see notations like these, and your job is to say, okay, convert that into code. We, we want a program to run and use that definition.
algorithms, okay? So when you look at how algorithms are you know, documented or uh, explained, there are occasions where you would see a certain step in an algorithm and, it, and this, is, this side is what they give you. They don't give you the for loop, they don't give you the conditional statement, they, give, they don't give you anything in, a partic in the syntax of a particular programming language. They just use the mathematical notation to tell you what the algorithm, what the result should be. How you get it done? Well, I mean, it depends on the programming, the programming language. So there are occasions you know, where you need, you need to do the translation between the mathematical notation and the code to get it done, yes? Well, you, you can visualize it like a tree, but ultimately it is a recursive definition of a mathematical function. So we can go through some more mathematical you know, definitions that are recursive, and um, I think it'll be helpful. Okay, let me, let me show you one more. Uh, but this is just an example of a math function. I'm looking for super note, there we go. All right, so let's take a look at f of n, so n is a natural number, okay, so I have to give you the range of what n can be. So I'm going to define f of n to be, if n is 0, then we return a 1, otherwise we return 2 times f of n minus 1. I'm just matching the parentheses. Yep, okay, there we go. So what do you think f of n actually does in this case? If I were to find the closed form, the easiest way to describe f of n, what is it? Okay, so how, how are you gonna solve that problem if, you're, if I were to ask you this question in an exam? exam? Yes. Exactly, write out the first few possible ends, right? Which end do you want to pick first? Or what value do you want to pick for the first end to solve? And go like, oh, okay, I see f of blah is blah. Which one requires the least effort on your part to figure out the answer? When it equals to zero, very good, because it says right here, when it is zero, f of n is one. Okay, cool. What about f of one then? So you look at f of one, one equals to zero, uh-uh, two times f of zero. So that would make it two, right? f of one is two. What about f of two? f of two, two equals to zero, uh-uh, becomes two of f of one. But we just figure out what is f of one, it is two, so f of two is four, okay? And then the next one is gonna be 8, 16, and so on. So what exactly is f of n? We have a suspicion that f of n is 2 to the power of n. Okay? Now, did I prove it to you? No, I actually did not prove that f of n equals to 2 to the power of n. But we have a pretty strong suspicion that that is the case. Okay, we try zero, works out. We try one, it works out. We try two, it works out. We try three, it works out, and so on. But, that, but those are not proofs. They are simply saying that in certain cases, okay, f of n seems to do the same thing as two to the power of n. There's always that chance of, but what about this n here? I bet you that doesn't work, right? So we will get to proof by induction in this class where we can re-examine something like this but then we have the formal way to prove it. But I want to kind of plant that seed right now because proof by induction is a proof technique that works best for recursive definitions. And this is a recursive definition because the definition of the function calls itself in certain cases. Is that okay? All right.
But does it make sense to you? It does make sense to you. Okay, very good. But once again, we are looking at quote unquote a mathematical notation here, and occasionally you have to turn it into actual code. But in this case, it's easy, right? Because all you have to say is to say unsigned f of unsigned n, okay, in the curly braces, and then in the curly braces, you just say return, and then you can keep this part here because that is actually valid for the most part, valid C code. The only part about this part, there are two parts that are not valid. One is you need double equal, and the second one is you need a multiplication and asterisk here. And with those changes, it is valid C C++ code. All right, so are there any questions about the original thing that we were talking about, which is this function here? So this one gives us all the possible permutation outcomes of an experiment. Yes? When you just said that, it made sense. Okay, all right. Don't hesitate to ask, okay? Um, the next one is what about combinations? In other words, what if ordering is not important? I want to get all the possible combinations when I'm given a bag of marbles, but this time, instead of a tube, on the other hand, I have another bag. Because when I use the word bag, that means ordering is not important. When I use a tube, then ordering is important. Is that okay? So in this case, I'm, you know, I just want to find out how many different ways can I choose a particular number, which is i, out of a bag, which is the set x here, give me all the possible combinations of, of that particular experiment. So that's what your know, big U of i, x is trying to, fig to figure out. Once again, we try to handle the easiest case, which is here's a bag of marbles, here's an empty bag, and I want you to do something for me. And you go like, okay, what do you want me to do? Don't take anything out of the bag and give me the, the, the other bag back, okay? So you give me the other bag back, and it's like, it's empty, good, okay? You follow the instructions. That's one outcome. So that's why when you are given a bag that may or may not be empty, X can be gigantic, can be empty, we don't care. You are asked to remove nothing from that bag and put it into the empty bag, what, is, what are the possibilities? What is the set of possible outcomes? It has one single outcome, which is you give me the empty bag back. Does that make sense? Okay, so now for the recursive one, this one does look a little uglier than the other one. <laughs> so we'll see what, what, what this really is, okay? So if I, generally speaking, if I just say, um, I'll give you x and then i is non-zero, because if i is zero, we know how to do that already. So i is non-zero here. What are we gonna do? Well, I'm gonna say, well, let me pick one element, or pick one marble out of the bag, okay? So that is represented by you know, me putting that marble into the hypothetical bag, right? The question is, what other things can we put into the bag? Because I just handled one of the i experiments that I was asked to do. So there are i minus one trials that still needs to be performed. So I go like, I'm not gonna do that. I'll ask somebody else to do it. So that somebody else is this recursive call here. That recursive call is the set provide, it's a set of sets providing the item that we iterate through using the nested big U operation. Okay, so that's a little bit, I know it's, it, it's, it's a little awkward here, but what are, we, what we are generating is we first figure out, okay, so I took one thing out of the bag, you figure out you know, all the other combinations that can be generated using you know, with I minus one trials, and the bag now has one item missing because I just took it. Right? So this part here, okay, this part here is giving us, you know, the set of all the combinations with ele element E missing from the bag 
and there are only i minus one trials. Is that okay? So now I go like, okay, but for each possible outcome like that, wait, I, I need to include mine, the one that I chose a little bit earlier. Let's include that one, you know, but the only way I can do include is a union in this case. So when you look at this entire thing from here to here, each one, you know, for each element E, this thing from here all the way to here is giving us all the combinations of if I choose E to begin with, then what combinations are possible with the remaining trials of the experiment? And I just have to iterate all the possible elements in the bag at my level, union all of those things together, then I get you know, the actual outcome. So mathematically speaking, this will work. But practically speaking, this is actually wasting a lot of time because there will be a lot of identical sets and there will be a lot of overlapping you know, between the unions. So it is actually very time consuming, unnecessarily time consuming in this case. But mathematically speaking, it does get the job done. All right. So I think one thing you can do, okay, this is not a homework assignment. However, I do want you guys to kind of go through the motion of following these instructions. So one thing I would kind of suggest people to do for this part of the class is to figure out you know, what is omega two of a set, oops, of a set that has A, B, and C in it. Okay, just try to figure this out by hand, okay, using the recursive definition. So don't try to do this you know, intuitively, do this you're know, following the instruction. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take you a little bit of time, okay, I, can, I have to say it, it's going to be a little bit tedious, okay, but do it anyway, because the, when you do this, you start to understand the recursive algorithm and how it works. And obviously the other one is to use the big U notation using the same set. So this is really just an exercise for you guys to kind of get used to the notation and also get used to the, how recursive functions work. Okay. All right. So are we doing good so far? The big omega and the big U notation are the last part of this module. So we're gonna move on to the next module right now. So then moving on to the next module. It has a very simple, deceptively simple title, which is discrete probability. Well, it's not quite as bad as counting, but. So we are only gonna get started here, but we have already talked about some of these topics in discrete probability. It's just that we haven't really introduced the formal terms of you know, um, what we are dealing with. Section two is kind of important. We talk about outcomes already. So the term outcome is discussed in module 0305, which was the one that we just looked at. But the concept of an event is not explained yet. So an event is a subset of omega. In other words, there are certain elements that seems to be of interest to us for one reason or another. How events are constructed depends on the application of probabilities. For example, in a Powerball lottery, a particular event can include all the tickets that win a particular prize. So you get to decide what the members of the event is. But in all cases, the event set is a subset of omega. So if E is representing the event set, then the cardinality of the event set divided by the cardinality of omega which are all the possible outcomes, is the probability of that event happening. Okay, so let's pause here and see if we can connect these kind of abstract terms to things that we have done today. What do you think? Have we touched on probability today? Like the first thing, right? So in that case, what is omega? You want me to go back to that tree, to those trees? Yep. Uh, omega is the set of all possible outcomes. 
Mm -hmm. So would that be the first tree that I drew or the second tree that I drew? The first one, that is correct. Okay, so let me go back to that tree. If my, yep, yep, there you go. So this tree is representing omega. It is representing all the possibilities. Given two people each year has three days, these are the nine possible ways that we can have two people choosing you know, two birth dates with no restrictions whatsoever. They can, they can be born on the same day if they, okay? So this is omega. This one is our event. In other words, I'm specifically interested in, you know, what are the chances that everybody in the class has unique birth dates? Because I promised the class, if there are at least two people born on the same day, I'm gonna buy the birthday cake. So I naturally want to understand the probability of when I don't have to pay for the birthday cake. Does that make sense? So how you choose the membership of the event really depends on a lot of things. There's no set structure of saying, oh, this is how you should define the event set. The event set really is just what you're interested in. Of all the elements of omega, which is the previous slide, what are the ones that I'm interested in? And that's how you define the event set. So what about the probability? We already talked about the probability, I think, in the one before. Okay. This is our probability. It is the cardinality of E, which is on the next slide, divided by the cardinality of omega. So there's a two-third of a chance that I don't have to buy the birthday cake because the two people do not share the same birthday. Is that okay? That's it, okay? Just terminology. But the terminology is important. Even though they are very simple, they are important as well because you know, once we understand those terms, then we can define probability. And we have talked about probability from the get-go as soon as we started you know, this entire topic because the first thing I was asking was, what are the chances that I can win the jackpot of the Powerball Lotto? Do you guys remember that? Okay, it, the, chances, the chances is one divided by close to 300 million. That's the chance. In that case, because only out of the 300 million possible tickets, only one is the jackpot. That's why it's one divided by 300 million. But what about the $7 one, okay? We figure that one out too, okay? So we have been using these concepts all along. It's just that I never formally introduced, you know, omega is all the possible things, and then E, or the event set, are the things that I'm interested in, which has to be a subset of omega. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So I have a, we, we are running out of time, so we are gonna continue this next Monday because what's gonna happen on Wednesday? The second exam. Okay, very good. Okay, I can see most of you are remembering and no one is having a little heart attack and go like, <gasps> Okay, so you know, this is the birthday problem, which I have explained twice already, and this is going through the math. Coin toss, okay? This is also an interesting problem, okay? Not because it's theoretical, but because in computer science, this is actually important. For instance, okay? So let's just go back to, I know we are running out of time, but I still got a few seconds. So let's just kind of roll back the clock before the five gigahertz Wi-Fi, you know, standard. So before that is 2.4 gigahertz, okay? So um, I think it's Wi-Fi G, you know, only make use of 2.4 gigahertz or thereabout. Well, guess who else wants to use 2.4 gigahertz? Bluetooth, you go like, well, eh, Bluetooth is not a big deal. Low power devices, it's not gonna interfere. Your microwave oven is also around 2.4 gigahertz. So do you think your microwave oven, you know, is a powerful device? What is the wattage of your microwave oven? somewhere between 800 to 1200 watts. That's a lot of power, okay? Yes, even after you close the door, there's still a lot of leakage of that energy out. So that is why 
if your gaming computer is here, this is this is really good because it has to do with the Eclipse. This is your Wi. This is your gaming computer. This is your Wi-Fi router, and this is the microwave, kind of in between. So think about your Wi-Fi router as the sun, your gaming computer as the Earth, and the microwave oven as the moon. Okay, if somebody is microwaving something, you're gonna get insane lag time <laughs> because the microwave is just blasting out wide spectrum around you know 2.4 gigahertz because that turns out to be the natural resonance frequency of how water molecules like to vibrate. I think it's the V-shaped thing and not the you know this shape because there are multiple ways you know the molecule can vibrate, and that's why they use that particular frequency to heat up things that contains water. But in this discussion, it's going to mess up your Wi-Fi connection. So I think at that point, you probably are interested in knowing what is the probability that a certain size of packet can be transmitted properly over your Wi-Fi network. Because you want to find out how bad the, net, the lag time is going to be when, you're, when other people in your household decides I got an entire big soup to heat up. It's going to take the next two minutes. And then during those two minutes, you really want to know, you know how bad your lag time can go because you might just want to forfeit the game. <laughs> Does anyone have that experience? Or you guys are all studious and never play video games? I have to lift the earphones and then I use the microwave and cover it. <laughs> and they and they tell us you know don't use Bluetooth have headphones because it's going to fry your brain. Um, even if you wanted to fry your brain with your Bluetooth, think about how much time it takes to charge your Bluetooth headset. Even if you are to short out the battery of your Bluetooth headset, how much heat can it possibly generate? Eh, a little bit. It can burn your finger and so on. Okay. And then think about the water content of your brain. Now, mine is a little small, so it, I guess it can fry like, just like that. But most of you have larger brains. Your entire skull is about 10 pounds. It's the, it's the, it's the weight of a bowling ball. Okay? And a lot of that is your brain. <laughs> so you can kind of imagine, if you want to fry your brain, which means bringing up the temperature to the point where you know, cells will start to die off, it takes a lot, okay? So I don't think there's any chance that the Bluetooth, your headset, can in any way cause problems with your brain. The only problem is what kind of music you're listening to. <laughs> All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Don't forget, it is exam two, so get started with your sheets of paper that you're gonna bring with you, okay? I'll see you all in two days, minus, 80 minutes. Because <laughs> I don't want people to show up exactly at this time and go like, but you told me to come back in two days, which is 48 hours exactly. Yep. I will make a good lawyer. <laughs>